This idea of Picard's iterative method is a way of getting towards the solution of a differential equation, even if it can't be solved analytically, and maybe even getting all the way to the solution. But even if we can't find the solution, Picard's iterative method often gets us at least um, an approximate. The idea is we take this, this differential equation, as long as we've got a first order equation that can be written y prime equals something about t and y. So f of t and y is just the other side of the equation. Uh, with the initial condition zero, zero. This, the, the method is basically standardized for assuming that the initial conditions are a zero, zero. If you have initial conditions somewhere else, you basically have to do a, a change of coordinates, a substitution to make it at zero, zero. But let's assume for the moment that we have initial conditions at zero, zero. The main idea of Picard's method is rewriting the differential equation as an integral equation by taking the integral of both sides. So instead of saying the derivative of y is all this stuff, we say y is the integral of all this stuff with respect to t. Or really, since we're technically using a fundamental theorem of calculus here, you could say integral of using some placeholder variable instead of t, let's say s, and then integrating from 0 to t. So technically, oh, I guess it shouldn't have a prime on it either. Technically, we would say it's the definite integral of the function, the other side of the differential equation, using a placeholder variable s instead of t. But then we're integrating from 0 to t, so it ends up becoming t anyway. The idea is if, y, if we replace y with some solution of the differential equation to make the original differential equation true, it also makes this integral equation true. So if we truly have a solution and plug it in for y here and for y here, this equation should be true. If what we have is not a solution, then we plug in y here and y here, and the equation won't be true. But the idea is you can think of this integral as a process being done to the y, fun the y function we're looking at. Let's say we treat y as some sort of guess. If you think of this y as a guess for the solution, this integral will turn it into another function that's a better guess, that's closer to the actual solution. So you can treat this as a, a single step process for turning a not so great guess into a better guess. And then if you keep repeating that process over and over again, you get better and better and better guesses. Any questions on the procedure behind that so far? So ideally, you just get this sequence of better and better guesses. You could say, like, let's say you guess y0. Where y0 is just some function of t. And here, in this case, y0 doesn't mean y the y value at time 0. y0 of t means some function that we're using as a guess. The idea is you plug that into here and crank through this integral in order to get what, a new function that we're going to call y1. y1 is going to be this whole process. And I'm just going to write this in terms of t. Formally, it's often written out using a placeholder, placeholder variable and then integrated from 0 to t. But you can just think of that as an antiderivative anyway. Works out to the same thing with fundamental theorem of calculus. But the idea is we use y0 in this integral to get y1. And y1 should be a better guess. Then to make an even better guess, we run through the same integral, but using y1 as the input to get y2, which is an even better guess. And then we use y2 as the input and run through the exact same integral to get an even better guess, and so on. So we get this sequence of guesses, y0, y1, y2, y3, each of which is some function of t that's a better approximation of the solution than the previous one. If you just stop that process at some point, let's say we take this out to y5 and stop, what we have is an approximation. 
Uh, no, strictly speaking, we're not adding to the previous one. We're integrating what we had before. That, often, that integral often leads to repeating what we had before plus one other term. But if that's the case, that'll arise naturally from taking the integral. So we're not adding something new onto this. We're just integrating this function applied to the previous guess. So each step, we're just integrating whatever this operation is applied to T and the previous guess. And that gives us our new guess, our next step in this sequence. So technically it is a sequence, not a series, but the elements within that sequence will often be several things added together. Um, oh yeah, Euler's method for approximating a solution is different. Euler's method goes, uh, tracks a sequence of points, one point at a time to draw out the graph. This one, instead of tracing a sequence of points, it's a sequence of functions. So the, let me see if I can describe this visually. Visually, Euler's method Uh, you start with some point and Euler's method is about finding the slope at that point to get to another point and then finding the slope at that point, going a little further to get another point, finding the slope at that point, going a little further to get to another point and so on. So Euler's method is a sequence of points that taken together uh, form a, a shape close to the solution curve. As opposed to Picard's method isn't about finding points. Picard's method is of, about creating a sequence of curves that get closer and closer to the actual solution. So Picard's method, you start with a very bad guess. And the very bad guess is usually just a constant. So typically we're gonna start with a guess that's just, let's say a constant, usually just y equals zero. And then running that through the integral process once gives you another function that's slightly better. Let's say that becomes some sort of diagonal straight line. And then running that through the function again is gonna make a slightly better guess slightly better approximation. And then running that through the function again, or through the integral again, is gonna make an even better approximation. And running that through the integral again makes a better approximation. So instead of getting a sequence of points that when you play connect the dots become close to the actual curve, you instead get a sequence of curves that get closer and closer to the actual solution curve. So that's visually the main difference between Euler's method versus Picard's method. They're both useful approximation methods for solving initial value problems, but they're completely different approaches to getting there. Any questions on that so far? And if you're wondering which one would be more useful in different situations, I would say Euler's method is probably more useful if you're specifically trying to find the y value at a certain t value. Like if all you care about is when t is five, what's the y value? Euler's method works really well for that. If what you care about is what kind of function you get, what shape of curve you get, Picard's method is probably more useful for that. Also Picard's method often allows you to actually go all the way to finding the exact solution. Whereas Euler's method can only get you a sequence of points. It can't actually get you a formula for y as a function of t. Any other questions on the theory behind all that so far? All right, then let's try actually running the numbers on this one. We have, uh, let me pull up that example. We're looking at the differential equation, y prime equals two times, uh, actually let's try part B here. I think that'll be more useful. Y prime equals y plus one minus t. So that is what we're gonna call the f of y and t function or f of t and y, whatever order we're using. 
And of course, we're assuming that the initial condition is zero, zero, because we have to assume that it goes to the origin in order for this method to work. It's basically standardized to uh, the origin as the initial conditions. So let's try running the equations here. We're going to start by guessing uh, that our function is just y equals zero, just a flat line through the basically just the t-axis. And of course, that's not the solution. You can check by plugging it into the original differential equation. Zero is not equal to zero plus one minus t. So this is definitely not a solution. But we're going to use it as the guess. And then the iteration, the integral process here, should give us a better guess. So let's try writing that up. We're going to say, let y1 equal integral of f of t y 0 dt. The idea is f of t y is just this whole thing. So we're going to write out exactly this, but we're going to replace y with 0, the previous guess. So we're integrating this whole thing. But y0, our previous guess, is 0, which means really we're just integrating 1 minus t. And what's the integral of 1 minus t? It'd be a t minus 1 half t squared. Yeah. And strictly speaking, if we're treating this as an indefinite integral, we would have a plus c. But the fact that we're assuming the initial condition is 0, 0 guarantees that c is going to be 0 anyway. Because if you plug in 0 for t and plug in 0 for y, I guess that'll be y1. Plug in 0 for t and y, you end up with c is 0 anyway. So one of the benefits of specifying that the initial conditions are at the origin is that it guarantees the plus c is going to be 0. So this is our next guess. We started by guessing that y is a constant, just y equals 0, a flat line. And of course, that doesn't work. But by using that guess as sort of the seed in this process, it grows into a better guess, t minus 1 half t squared. And of course, if you plug this into the original differential equation, it still won't make it true. But it forms a better approximation than the previous one did. Any questions on that process so far? Then let's try going one step further. We now know that uh, y1 is t minus 1 half t squared. What we're going to do is we're going to feed that back into the exact same iterative process. We're going to say y2 is the integral of the same f of ty. But instead of y0, we're now going to use y1 as our next seed. In other words, we're integrating, again, this exact function of t and y, y plus 1 minus t. But we're specifically using y1. So that's the function f of ty, the other side of the differential equation in the first place. But we know y1 was t minus 1 half t squared. So we can fill this in for y1. So that's t minus 1 half t squared. And then we're going to integrate that. And note that this does often end up having one more term, one more term, one more term every time. Because in many situations, when you plug in y1, you get whatever terms you had plus some other terms. And then you're integrating all those terms. And so then your next guess is going to have all those terms. You take all those terms plus 1 minus t and integrate that. So often, this process results in accumulating more and more terms each step. You're not adding the previous one. You're just integrating the previous one plus some other stuff. But that often results in more and more terms accumulating as, the, as these steps go by. However, we're not actually going to accumulate in this case, because what happens if we simplify this? 
cancel. Sorry. Yeah, these T's cancel out because we've got a plus T from our previous guess, and we've got a minus T from the differential equation itself. In this case, those happen to cancel out. So instead of having four terms to integrate, we actually only have two terms to integrate. And we integrate those. What's the integral of negative one half t squared? Negative one sixth t cubed. Yeah, because we're dividing by the new exponent three and then plus one just becomes plus t as usual. And instead of having a plus c, we can leave out the plus c because we just have, what was it? Initial condition zero, zero. So we plug in zero for t, zero for y, and we just get c equals zero anyway. So that is our y2, that is our, our next guess in this, uh, this iterative approximation. Iterative in the sense of repeating the same cycle over and over again. Any questions on that so far? All right, so that's Y2. And I'm gonna flip the order there just to be consistent with the other one that we've already got. Y2 is T minus one sixth T cubed. And let's try the same process again to get uh, Y sub three. y sub three is gonna be same process, integral of this whole function, f of t y, but specifically using y two as our seed for this new process. So what we got for y two becomes the new seed value here, the new input for our, our process, the, the iterative process. Uh, let me take this up to here to get some more room. So we're integrating this whole thing, y, plus one minus T. But now instead of Y, we're gonna, or we're gonna replace Y with what we got for Y2, our previous guess. So T minus one sixth T cubed. And what happens when we simplify this? The T cancels out again. Once more, the plus T and minus T cancel out. So we're still integrating just two terms. This is kind of unusual in the sense that this integral doesn't keep, this process in this case, doesn't keep accumulating more and more terms because we're always gonna have a T from integrating this one and we're always gonna have a minus T from the differential equation itself. So it looks like that plus T and minus T will always cancel out. We just get, what does the negative one sixth T cubed become? A negative T to the fourth divided by 24 plus T. Yeah, that should do it. So that's our Y3 negative, or we, again, we can reverse the order just for consistency, T minus T to the fourth over 24. Any questions on the integral so far? And it looks like this is starting to follow a pretty consistent pattern here. All these results have, except for the very first one, the zero guess, of course, which doesn't really count. All the results beyond that have a T minus one over something times T to a power. Because no matter what it is, as long as we've got T minus one over something times T to a power, that T and this minus T are gonna cancel out when we plug it into the, the process. The plus one becomes plus T, which is the T for the next guess, the next step. And this minus some fraction of T to a power just becomes a different fraction of T to a higher power. So in general, it looks like we can conclude or at least make an educated guess, a hypothesis that the nth guess is gonna be, presumably it's gonna have a T minus something. And what's the pattern in these, uh, these T to a whatever power term? So one over N factorial. 
Yeah, these are all factorials, right? Because each step we're just multiplying by one over the next power, the next value. And yeah, these exponents are all just uh, that n value plus one. So it looks like t to the n plus one power over, yeah, I think n plus one factorial will work there. Because for instance, for two, we take n plus one and we get three, we get t to the third over three factorial. For three, we add one to n and we get four, and we do indeed have t to the fourth over four factorial. So presumably the next one will be t minus t to the fifth over five factorial. And of course, you can check your hypothesis by plugging it into that process again. If we integrate y sub n, plus one minus t. We should get y sub n plus one. We should get t the same t minus t to the n plus two over n plus two factorial. And that's exactly what happens because once again, the t and the minus t cancel out. Integral of t one becomes t. Integral of t to the n plus one becomes t to the n plus two divided by n plus two. The n plus two combines with the n plus one factorial we already have to become n plus two factorial. So it looks like y sub n plus one follows the exact same pattern. And this becomes an induction thing that since n could have been any whole number and we get the correct value for the next whole number, that means it keeps going. n could have been any whole number. Like for if y sub 100 fits this pattern, then y sub 101 also fits this pattern. So we can say that this chain keeps going. This is going to be the exact same pattern for all, all natural numbers. How do we put this in a summation? The thing is, we don't really have a summation here. The result, like if we took the, the first term, there's only the first guess, there's only two terms in it. The 10th guess would also have two terms. It would just be t minus t to the 11 over 11 factorial. The 1,000th guess would still just have two terms. It would be t minus t to 1001 over 1001 factorial. So we don't really have a summation to write out here. This is the nth term. Okay, okay. And we could just stop at some point and use it as an approximation. We could say, let's stop at term three and this is an approximation for the solution. But it's not all that great an approximation. We can get a, not only a good approximation, but a perfect approximation, the actual answer how would we write out making n get larger and larger and larger mathematically? Yeah, we can write this as a limit. Each one of these y sub whatevers is an approximation, but the limit of that sequence as n goes to infinity should be the exact value, assuming the sequence converges at all. So if the sequence converges, and according to the existence and uniqueness theorem, it should converge, then we should be able to get the exact solution by taking the limit. Y should equal the limit of Y sub N as N goes to infinity. So let's try that. Limit as N goes to infinity of T minus T to the N plus one over N plus one factorial. And t doesn't have any n in it at all. So that doesn't even change. This is just t minus. And what happens to these as n gets larger and larger? It, it goes to zero, but I don't, I don't know how to prove why it does. That's the tricky part. Because the thing is, the numerator and denominator, as n grows, the numerator and denominator are both going to infinity, right? Yeah. And usually if you've got numerator and denominator both going to infinity or both going to zero, what would you use to find the actual limit? L'Hopital's. Right. Only problem is L'Hopital's rule involves a derivative and you can't really take a derivative of factorial because it's discrete rather than continuous. It doesn't have the in-between values. It's just whole numbers. So instead we're gonna have to take something of a more intuitive approach here. We're gonna have to figure out without using calculus why n plus one factorial is growing faster than t to the n plus one. Because looking at L'Hopital's rule more conceptually, the reason why we look at the derivatives of the numerator and denominator is we care about which one's growing faster. 
yes, the numerator is going to infinity. Yes, the denominator is going to infinity. What we care about is which one's growing faster. If the numerator is going, growing faster, the whole thing goes to infinity. If the denominator is growing faster, then the whole thing goes to zero. And I think we can see why this works, why the numerator is growing slower and the denominator is growing faster if we write out the first so many terms. Like for instance, t to the n plus one, if we expanded that out, what would it look like? What does t to a large power actually mean? It'd be like t times t times, you know, whatever, t to the t to the n, you know, whatever. Right. So we have n plus one copies of t multiplied together, divided by, and then how would n plus one factorial start? n plus one times n times n minus one. Yeah. And all the way down to one. And if t is very small, like let's say t is, if t is one, then we get just one over n plus one factorial. That definitely is gonna get smaller and smaller. If t is less than one, then t uh, number less than one to a high power gets even smaller still. So that definitely goes to zero. We really only need to worry about when t is a large number. So let's assume t is very large. But since we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity, no matter how big t is, n will eventually get bigger because we're looking at n getting arbitrarily large. So if we're going from one through n plus one, at some point in between, we're gonna pass the value of t. And let's assume t is a whole number uh, for the moment, but even if t is not a whole number, we can just say we get up to the point where we have gotten to the whole number just bigger than t. So let's say at some point we pass t. All of the fractions, if we split this up into individual fractions, t over n plus one, t over n, t over n minus one. At some point in between, we're gonna have a t over t. Well, let's say we include a few terms here, t over t plus one, t over t, t over t minus one. And then eventually t over three, t over two, t over one. And let's say t is really large, like a million. A million over one times a million over two times a million over three. These are huge numbers. But eventually we get to a million over a million. That's just gonna be one. And everything beyond that point is gonna be less than one. So we've got a bunch of numbers, more than one multiplied together but then multiplied by a bunch of numbers less than one multiplied together. And if we're taking the limit, how many numbers less than one do we have out here? Infinite. Right, we have infinitely, or the, the potential for infinitely many anyway. If we take n out far enough, we have as many as, it is, as many as we need. Because no matter how many numbers larger than one we have on this side, we can just assume n gets large enough that we have even more numbers less than one you know, have to cancel out all those other ones. So if we take n out far enough, eventually all of these factors less than one will, will cancel out all the factors more than one. So you just get one or somewhere around one. But we keep going because we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity. So after that point, the total product gets smaller and smaller and smaller approaching zero. Any other questions on that so far? So I think it's safe to say, based on this argument, that this whole thing goes to zero. So all that's left is just y equals t. That should be the actual specific solution. Not just a general solution, but the specific solution based on this initial condition. And of course, we can check that by plugging it into the original differential equation. If y is t, then y prime will be one. So if we fill those in, y prime is one, y is t plus one minus t. True? Yeah. So that means, yes, this really is a solution to the original differential equation. 
And it certainly is true if T is zero and Y is zero. So that means this is the specific solution passing through this initial condition. And of course, the Picard's method is a very inefficient method of solving this. This what would probably be the, the most direct way of solving this system if you just wanted to use an analytic approach rather than a, the, the integrating factor, or you could just look at it, but integrating factor would be the. Yeah, and I, I, I'm a little cautious about the just look at it approach because sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. And that varies yeah. from person, of course. Um, but since the, this is definitely linear, we can write it as y prime plus negative one y equals one minus t. So we've got y prime plus something y equals something. That is absolutely a linear first order differential equation. So it's guaranteed that the integrating factors approach would work here. Uh, so if I, was, if I was just presented with this differential equation and told to solve this differential equation, I would just uh, default directly to the integrating factors approach. But the Picard's method approach also works. And Picard's method is a much more broadly applicable process because even if they, you're dealing with a nonlinear differential equation, if you're dealing with some sort of first order equation where none of the other approaches seem to be working, Picard's method should get you at least an approximation. Even if the process doesn't lead to a recognizable limit you can take, as long as you can write out like maybe the 10th term or something, the 10th term or however far you wanna go will be a pretty good approximation for the solution. Like as we were looking at uh, the y sub three, for instance, t minus t to the fourth over 24. This is not y equals t at all. It's not even a linear function. But what can you say about t to the fourth over 24 if t is close to the initial condition, close to zero? It's, it's pretty close. It's, yeah, this is gonna be pretty yeah. close. Exactly, this is gonna get closer and closer to zero. If we're talking about t values close to the initial condition, because that's really what we care about for approximations, like let's say t is 0.1 or 1 one tenth. One tenth to the fourth power would be 1 ten thousandth divided by 24 would be 1 24 thousandth. So that means at a tenth of a space away from the initial condition, this is within 1 24 thousandth, no wait, 1 240 thousandth of the actual value. So this is a very close approximation if we're, let's say, between negative one and one. The further out we go, the worse the approximation gets. But it's gonna be a pretty close approximation if we're near the initial condition. And of course, if you need more accuracy, you could just take this out to further and further steps. Like if you take this out to, let's say, y to the 100th, or y sub 100, I mean, you get t minus t to the 101 over 101 factorial. And t to the 101 looks like it's going to be way off, but you're dividing by 101 factorial, which is enormous. So for a very wide range of t values, that t to the 101 over 101 factorial is going to be pretty close to zero, which means we get pretty close to the actual answer. Any other questions on Picard's method? All right, let's try this out with something else that is not just going to lead to uh, the terms canceling out like they did here. Let's try maybe, let me pick another one. I think I was confused on the last one because um, on part A of one, it like it gave us, you know, you ended up having to get a sum that you took the limit of. And yep. so when I did part B, I was trying to get a summation, even though like we really didn't need one. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah the, the difference is like in, in, in that one we just did, the, uh, the plus T that ends up in every guess and the minus T that was in the differential equation itself mm -hmm. end up canceling out in every, every, every step of the process. Right. So yeah. instead of accumulating more and more terms, the old terms cancel out and get replaced by new terms that are now the only terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool, thank you. So sometimes that does turn into a series, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes because of terms canceling out or just replacing the previous terms, you just get a, a finite number of terms that keep the same amount of terms, but just change what they are. Yeah, I, I was like trying to overcomplicate it, <laughs> but yeah, I thought it was just like as straightforward as like it seemed, yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, let's take a look at one that is going to lead to a series. I think this uh, part A should work well for that. If we have, well, let me just make up another one. Let's say we have like five times y plus three. And we'll see what we get there. Or I guess we may as well just simplify that to five y plus 15. So we should be able to use the same process. We have this function that we're going to call f of t and y. Although really it's just f of y because this equation happens to be autonomous. There is no t term at all. But let's see what we get here. We're going to still guess that our original guess is 0 because that's the initial condition anyway. If the initial condition was like t equals 0, y equals something else, we would guess that something else as our constant initial guess. Uh, but we're assuming we're standardizing this to the origin as the initial condition. Your initial guess doesn't have to be a constant function, by the way. You could choose any function you want that passes through the origin as your initial guess. And some initial guesses might end up converging to the actual solution much faster. But if you're not sure what to guess, then you can always just guess a constant function and the results should converge towards the actual solution. Uh, so let's try that. Let y1 equal same process, integral of f of t y0 dt using our previous guess as the seed to develop the new guess. In this case, f of t y is just 5y plus 15. So this is just 5y plus 15. And y happens to be 0. So that's our guess, or that's our process. We integrate that. What do we get for the integral there? Uh, 15 t. Yeah, 15 t, because zero is still zero. 15 becomes 15 t. And we don't need a plus c because the initial condition is zero, zero. So 15 t is our y1 guess. Oh, I have a question. So if t wasn't zero, say t was one, then we would have to put like one to t for the integral? Uh, it's more that the, uh, the thing is this method, this entire method is, de is developed assuming that the initial condition is zero, zero. If the initial condition is not zero, zero, then what you want to do is make a change of coordinates. Like let's say the initial condition was, uh, let's say t equals five, y equals three. What you would do is you'd make up new variables that force the new initial conditions to be zero. You might say, let's say we make up a new variable x. And since we want x to be zero as the starting value, how do you turn the t value into zero? Uh, t minus five. <laughs> Yeah, we can just make up a new variable. This is one of the superpowers of a mathematician. You can just make up a variable and define it to be whatever you want. If we specifically make up a new variable x that's equal to t minus 5, then the initial conditions are x equals 5 minus 5, which is 0. And also, let's make up a new function. Let's say z is a function of x, which happens to be y minus 3. That way, t equals 5, y equals 3 becomes x equals 5 minus 5, which is 0, and z equals 3 minus 3, which is 0. So by setting up these new, these new variables, changing this, just this substitution to change the coordinate system, then we have new initial conditions. Ultimately, what we're doing there is we're taking our t, y axis, which has a point at 5, 3, And we're just making up a new coordinate system, putting an x-axis here and a z-axis here. Now the initial condition is 0, 0. And this does require some slight rewrites of the differential equation itself. For instance, if z is y plus 3, then y is, or if z is y minus 3, then y is z plus 3. So every y in the differential equation would have to be replaced with z plus 3. But when you take the derivative, you just get z prime anyway. So 
dy dt could be replaced with dz d, dz dx because x is also just t minus five. Uh, t itself could be replaced with x plus five by adding five to both sides. So when you do this coordinate change in the original differential equation, every t would be replaced with x plus five, every y would be replaced with z plus three, but the y prime, the dy dt just becomes dz dx, no change needed for that. And then you would apply the uh, Picard's iterative method on the new differential equation in terms of x and z. Once you get the solution to that, then you can back substitute to turn it back into t and y. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're just translating, I guess you could consider this translating the problem into a slightly different language, solving it in terms of the new language, and then translating the answer back into the original language. I find that's a very useful analogy. If you, you can think of coordinate systems as being like languages. You're just taking a question and an answer you don't know, a question in a language you don't know how to deal with, translating it into a language you do know how to deal with, solving the problem in that new language, and then translating the answer back into the original language. Uh, in this case, though, we don't need to do that because the initial conditions are already at zero, zero. But let's try the next few steps just to see what this process approaches. <coughs> For y2, we're going to set up the same integral, integral of f of ty. But everywhere we see y, we're going to replace it with our previous guess, 15t. And what does that become when we integrate? You just asked what it becomes when we integrate it. It becomes. Um, y sub two is five times 15 t squared divided by two plus 15 t. Yeah. And of course we don't need a plus c because of the initial conditions. Notice in this case, we did add on an extra term. We started with the, I mean, we still have the 15 t that we had before. The 15 t has actually changed into this new term, but the plus 15 from this gives us a new plus 15 t. So the end result is 15t, like what we had before, plus an extra term that has arisen. And then if we integrate again, I think it's going to turn out to have these terms again, plus an extra term with a t cubed in it. So in this one, it looks like nothing's canceling out. And each step through this iterative method gives us an extra term, an extra term, an extra term. So this one is going to turn into an infinite series. And if we take the limit, we should end up with a Taylor series that should be some recognizable function. In this case, I think it might help to factor out, since it looks like each one of these is going to end up with a 15 in it, let's try factoring out the 15. Let's write this as 15 times 5t squared over 2 plus t. That way, each time we run through the integral, we can just factor out the 15 and see what's left. Any questions on that so far? And let's try one more step and see if we can develop a pattern. y3 is going to be integral of 5 times y. That's 5 times this whole thing. Plus another 15. So 5 times the whole thing so far, plus 15. And again, I'm noticing that 15 shows up in both of these terms. So let's factor out a 15. And we're left with 5 times 5 times t squared, so 25t squared over 2 plus 5t 
plus one. Integrate that and what do you get? Uh, you get five or you get five squared times t cubed divided by three times two. I kept, I don't simplify it. Sometimes it's easier for me to look at what I'm doing. Because um, leaving it unsimplified often makes it much easier to see those patterns. Like if we just got like, I don't know, 125 over 24, that might not be obvious. Mm -hmm. If it's five times five times five over four times three times two, that mm -hmm. becomes much more obvious that it's an exponential and a factorial. So I would absolutely recommend leaving it unsimplified like that. That's a very good, good very good way to write it. Okay, cool. And, and then uh, the five t is going to become what? Five t squared divided by two. Right. Plus fifteen t. Yeah. And the fifteen, I would recommend just leaving factored out, so you don't have to write it over and over again, just okay. as a quality of life improvement sort of thing. So that's our y three. Fifteen times. 5 squared t cubed over 3 factorial. And then we've got a 5 times t squared over, and then 2 could be thought of as 2 factorial. That's probably a good way to continue the pattern. 5 to the 1 times t to the 2 over 2 factorial. And lastly, just a plus t. But we could even write that as part of the pattern. 5 to the 0, because there's no 5s at all in this one, times t to the 1 over one factorial. Are you starting to see a pattern emerge here? Yes. What is the pattern we're getting here? I think it's five to the i minus one times, mm -hmm. or shoot, I didn't factor out, I like did it and I didn't factor out the 15. So I don't know if it's exactly the same, but I got that times 15 t yep. to the i divided by i factorial. Right. And yeah, the 15 we can pull out because it's a constant. It doesn't rely on i at all. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I would recommend doing here, since these exponents don't quite match up, it would be very convenient if we had an extra times 5 here. We can do that by multiplying by 5 and also dividing by 5 because we're not actually changing anything in that, in that case. We're just uh, multiplying and dividing by the same value. That way 15 over five becomes three. And what's five times five to the i minus one? If you've got five to the i minus one and multiply an extra five, what do you now have? Is it five to the i? And since we now have five to the i times t to the i, same power, we can combine those into just five t to the i over i factorial. And this is actually now a very famous uh, Taylor series. If we're looking at, because we really do have a summation here, we're, at, we're not just taking one term, we're taking n terms added together. So the nth term, is going to be the summation from i equals, looks like we started at 1 to n of this. And let's factor out the 3 also, because that's the same in every term anyway. So 5t to the i over i factorial. That looks almost exactly like the Taylor series for what function? E to the 5x. Yeah, e to the, or let's say e to the 5t in this case. Yeah, e to the 5t. You can see that right off the bat. It's often helpful to use a substitution. You've got this weird 5t here, but it shows up as 5t every single time. There's no t by itself. It's always 5t. So if it helps, you can always make up a substitution. Let x equal 5t. Now we have x to the i over i factorial. That's exactly the Taylor series for e to the x. It just becomes e to the 5t instead. With one small exception, the Taylor series for e to the x is supposed to start at i equals what? Zero. 
Yeah, we should be starting with i equals zero because we start with one plus x plus x squared over two plus x cubed over three factorial and so on. This one is starting at i equals one. It doesn't have that zero with term, but we can add that in. This is one of the great things about series. If you've got a series going from a number that's not quite right out to some value, like we want this to start with a zero with term, we can just add in the zero with term. What would the zero with term be? If you plug in zero for i, what would you get here? It'd be one. Yeah. We can add one as long as we also subtract one. That way we're not actually changing the value. And now this whole thing, including the plus one, this is now starting from zero to n. So this really does become e to the five t. This including this zero with term is the Taylor series for e to the five t. And if you're not sure, it can help to write it out like one plus five t plus five t squared over two factorial and so on. We still have this minus one. And we also still have this times three. But that means this should now be the exact specific solution of that initial value problem. Because that's the, that's the uh, function whose Taylor series is exactly what this sequence of steps approaches. Any other questions on that? All right, so give that a try with the other examples. Let me know if you have any other questions and I will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.